Good morning. It is right at 11 o'clock, so I appreciate everyone joining us today. I am Katie Robbins, and I am happy to be presenting today on a very interesting topic about finding the line between supervision and therapy. So before we get started, um, just a couple of housekeeping things. In the chat, Michelle dropped our email address um, so that if you're having any technical problems or have questions um, about the, the Zoom webinar, that's probably the best place to get a hold of us. Just because if you're having issues, it might be hard to send us a message in Zoom too. So we want to make sure you have our email address. Today, we're going to be using the Q&A function at the bottom. And I really want this training to be as interactive as possible. So please put questions and scenarios and and different um, things that you've run into in the Q&A throughout the whole training. It would be um, great to be able to use case examples that you guys have as well. I have lots of um, case examples that I can bring in too, but it's always nice when you guys when you guys have them and we can talk them through. A couple of other things, GATSA has a lot of um, trainings coming up over the next couple of months before license renewal, including ethics. This one's for ethics. We have ethics every month and we have major mental health um, series starting in May, going through June, and we are hoping to have another one in August so that you can hopefully get those six hours and then also your your ethics CEUs. So we on our website, we also have recorded trainings that you can go and do asynchronously. And um, as always, we love all of your feedback on what kinds of trainings you like to have um, as we get started to round up speakers and training topics for the fall and spring. So we love to hear those those ideas as well. Um, the other thing that we'll be doing throughout this training is we'll have some interaction through um, a platform called Slido. So we'll drop that in the chat, a link, but we'll also have a QR code that you can use. So hopefully you guys are able to participate with that as well. So without any further ado, I'm going to get ready to share my screen. So we're, I think that this is an interesting topic, mostly because we run into these types of situations all the time with our supervisees. So just again, for the objectives for today, we're gonna to be looking at how to foster personal growth for our supervisees so that they can be better overall therapists, help them connect their experiences and their emotions to the conceptualization of cases, provide strategies for managing the dual roles and responsibilities that, that come with professional relationships, um, like being a supervisor, and then also teaching effective techniques for delivering feedback so that we're being professional and therapeutic, balancing that line, and then also recognizing and honoring and incorporating all the diversity that's present in our supervisory relationships. So the other thing I think about when we're um, supervisors, I have felt all of these ways, confident, overwhelmed, bored, like a friend, like a fixer. As a supervisor, I think those are not all of the things that we feel, but depending on the supervisee, I think these are common things that we feel. You know, I've been supervising, uh, compared to some of you, a short amount of time, about 11 or 12 years, I've been supervising students and provisionally licensed people, which to me that that's, you know, seems like I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting good at it now, finally. Um, but early on, I felt very uncomfortable with it and not quite sure what direction to go and probably erred on the side of being a friend too much. Um, and then maybe I went um, to the fixer too much of like, I need to tell you how to do this because I felt really, um, you know, like that was really important for me to make sure that my supervisees are really good. Like there was a reflection of me. Um, so now I feel a lot more confident every once in a while. I feel a little overwhelmed. I think that's pretty normal, um, but I'm guessing all of you have felt these ways too. So um, again, I appreciate your your involvement with this. I'm sorry that the polls weren't working. I'm not sure why Zoom has decided that those aren't. Oh, look at that. I see the poll that came up. That's wonderful. We can do it now. 
hopefully you guys are able to see it and you can answer it. I'll give you guys a, a second. Um, Michelle, if you want to watch, I'm guessing, Michelle, if you found it, if you want to um, share the results when you feel like we have some good participation, that would be great. So, yeah, I would just love to hear a little bit more about how you are feeling as a supervisor, maybe not with every supervisee, but with some of them. I also supervise kind of a, a lot of people all the time. So I usually have examples of all of these things. So Hey, yeah. I just built that col that poll really, really quick on the fly there for you, Katie. So Thank you. um and we've got about sixty seven percent participation. So right. um, I'm I think sure that's there might good. be some people on their phones and stuff. So I'm gonna end yeah. the poll Perfect. and share their results. That'd be so great. You can see Awesome. I've got it. Yeah. Thank you okay. so much, Michelle. I appreciate that. I think that's you the last it. one what we were going to do. Okay. Um, this, well, maybe one more, but we'll, we'll get there. Yes, okay. Yes, I'll get it set up. Thank you. So um, a lot of you are feeling confident and I love that because I think that feeling confident allows you to deal with these types of situations better and more genuinely um, overwhelmed. Totally. I, I, I get that. I feel that way with some of my supervisees, especially the ones that have a lot going on in their lives. And I feel like we're not managing it well. And like a fixer, I, those are our top three. I think those are the things that I feel a lot. I only feel bored. I think when I'm working with somebody who just has trouble um, really explaining their situations well. And I feel like I'm just pulling everything out of them. And I'm like, oh, this is a lot of work. <laughs> So thank you. That was very helpful to kind of know how you're feeling. Thanks, Michelle, for building that. So the next one, um, we're just really going to talk about the first steps of how do we build rapport with our supervisees. I don't think we can have a training on supervision if we didn't talk about rapport first, because um, it's vital in any therapeutic relationship with our clients, but supervision really isn't different than that as far as um, needing to have rapport to talk about really vulnerable things. Um, I'm I'm really a firm believer too that you can build a lot of rapport without self-disclosing too much. Um, supervision is obviously different than working with clients, but I still think it's important to talk about um, not sharing too much personal information about yourself because um, if I'm completely open about my personal life, like I would be with a colleague or a friend, not all colleagues, but friends who are colleagues, let's say it that way. What does that mean when we're really talking about sensitive aspects of my supervisee's experience? I always talk about, um, I always give this, this example. Do I want my supervisee to censor themselves because they know I had a tough morning, like wrangling a toddler who was throwing a tantrum? And so then they feel like they don't want to overburden me with something that's been really hard for them to deal with and in, in their, um, with their clients. That's a really tame example, right? Um, but I, I think about those things. Like what is the balance there? Um, because some of building rapport with supervisees might be me sharing a little bit more about myself than I would normally with um, clients. But also, I think that I, I have done that before. Um, like I've supervised friends or people that I went to school with or, you know, like after went to school after me, but I knew them. And so then when you're supervising them, it feels natural to talk about yourself. And I, in hindsight, I don't know that they got the best experience because of that. So I'm really more cautious about supervising people that I know now for that reason. Um, I think it's great that we can, you know, supervise people that we know and also remembering that this is now turning from a friendship to a professional relationship. And what do you want that to look like? Because I think it can be tricky sometimes. I think the biggest change that I've made in regards to that is really setting more boundaries for myself early on. So I'm much more likely to share a ton about my experiences than about me. So talking about clients and cases and things that I've maybe done poorly in my therapeutic practice or things that I've done really well. Basically, what I'm disclosing is my work as professionally and with clients and taking vulnerabilities there of um, talking about 
maybe what I've learned working with certain clients and over the years versus the day-to-day stuff that's hard. Um, I think early on in this stage too, we want to really avoid too much direction or correction. So that's the fixer piece of it. Because we're in that rapport building phase, I think that we need to obviously address glaring issues right away. We, we can't have um, our, our supervisees providing unsafe or unethical um, uh, clinical services. So we do need to address those things. However, I think if we're just setting the stage of we're giving advice and telling them what to do, we're not really practicing or setting the stage for, for growth and critical thinking. Um, I also think that it can um, create an environment where envir- where supervisees kind of stop telling us what they're struggling with because they're, they're expecting us just to tell them how to fix it. Um, and I think for all of us, we're, we'll talk more about that later, but I don't think any of us like to just be told what to do. And uh, it gets it gets old after a while. So, with critical thinking in mind, we have to model um, how to f- how to start flexing that critical thinking muscle for our supervisees. Um, and I think that supervision feels similar sometimes to doing therapy, right? That's what we're talking about where we don't fix our clients' problems either. We collaborate with them and we figure out a direction to go um, and we act as a guide for processing. We make observations that our clients don't always see. You know, that's a huge part of our therapeutic practice. Um, And obviously it gets to be more than that. But with supervisees, we want to do that too. I don't want to tell them what to do all the time um, because that's not, really showing them how to do that with their clients either. I don't want to hear, oh yeah, I went into session and I told my client to do X, Y, and Z. I'm like, oh, okay. So we, we want to start modeling that in supervision too. You know, it really annoys me when people say, oh, being a therapist is probably so easy. You just sit in a room all day and tell people what to do. Like I've heard that from people who aren't in the field multiple times. (laughs) It's really annoying to me because that's not our job at all not even a little bit. It's the same for supervision. It's sometimes easy to slip into that model of thinking that we're just helping fix problems and give solutions, telling my supervisee what to do. And sometimes we are because that's what the situation needs. But it also isn't building critical thinking or independence. We're only supervising them for two or three years probably. Um, So in that span of time, I'm seeing them for an hour a week. In that span of time, I'm hoping that we can be very confident when they leave supervision, they are ready to go and making really excellent clinical decisions with their, with their clients. So in my opinion, rapport is just as important with our supervisees as with our clients. So um, also using your authentic self and your style and getting to know who you're supervising, just like you're getting to know a client through building rapport and trust Um, I think sets the stage well for a good relationship. I'm going to make sure that I have um, my Q&A pulled up just in case we need it. Okay. So this is a great, this is a great um, comment here that not always feeling overwhelmed, but I don't always feel confident that I'm helping my supervisees develop and grow. And then, okay, overseeing a supervision program and wanting to gain knowledge um, to keep everyone on the same page. I think that's such a good comment because I think that there are times when working with supervisees where maybe we didn't do as much growth and um, flexing that critical thinking muscle in this session. But I think the trajectory always is keeping that in mind. Um, Today, we're going to talk more. I'm going to actually give you guys a lot of examples of things to say or directions to go. Um, Yeah, another another question or a comment came in, just not feeling like you're always helping your supervisees. So I think that's super fair. And I feel that still sometimes not every supervisory session goes in a direction that I feel like would have been as helpful as, as others. But the trajectory is always that we're building 
um, over time, we're, we're building towards that goal. But yeah, today we're going to talk a lot about suggestions of how to get those conversations started or to, to pull it back to some to more growth oriented um, conversations. So I appreciate those comments. I think those are very normal and natural. So let's really get into it. This is tough. Once you uh, have built this beautiful rapport with your supervisee, you know, which can take some time. Um, you're going to start hearing random personal stuff and that's okay. Not from all of your supervisees for sure, but from some of them, uh, for those of you who only supervise one person at a time, if you're only supervising one person and it's a ton of personal stuff, it feels kind of overwhelming. If you're doing a couple, you know, it's like seeing clients, if you've got a couple clients who are really overwhelming, but then you have a couple that aren't as overwhelming. It feels like this nice balance. So um, in my experience for the, the supervisees who are kind of the oversharers and they have all this personal baggage that they're carrying around with them, it starts kind of small, like with a little disclosure here and there. Um, and you're all great therapists, I'm sure. So you have all these excellent skills of, listening and empathy and good stuff like that. So now you've built rapport. You're also this safe person that they trust to kind of talk to about this. So maybe your supervisee comes to you one day and you're like, Hey, you know, how's your, how's your week been? How's it going? And they're like, Oh, you know, my mom's coming into town and I'm super dreading it. We don't get along at all. Like what's your first response to that? What's your first like gut instinct to respond to that? Because mine is like, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. That's so tricky to navigate. And and then it's like, where do we go from there, right? A lot of times our supervisee will jump into all of their feelings about it. And you're like, oh, wait, 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 hold on. I didn't actually want to do all that with you, but now here we are. Um, and I think that it's, it's saying something like, oh, you know, that's really tricky to navigate. We're not actually asking for a lot of details. We're offering understanding and affirmation. It creates more trust, which is all really good, but then also not super great when we're talking about clients. And now we've just pivoted completely to something that's really tough for them. So the other thing is, is I, I don't actually want to respond totally aloof of like, Oh, that's cool. It'd be nice to spend time with your mom. It's like, I haven't listened to anything that they've said. They're prob I, if I, if it was me, I'd be kind of shut down and be like, Oh, they totally missed it. And there's no attunement. And, um, also I, pr if I'm the supervisee, I probably don't, I've probably broken some rapport there. I don't trust this person because they didn't actually listen to what I was saying, responded in a different way. Um, now, if I'm the supervisee, I don't really want to be vulnerable and I don't really want to to dive into things that are hard because I'm not sure if my supervisor is going to listen to me. Um, so it is a really delicate balance there that I think that we have to be mindful of, which is, which is okay. We don't have to be perfect at it, but also how much information do we want to get out of this situation? Um, and on the, um, oh yes, great. Sorry. I'm, I'm looking, I'm going back and forth to the Q and a, we had a great response in here too, of another person's response might be, um, how is that affecting you when you're working with patients? Yeah. And I use that all the time We're I'm actually, that will definitely be in this training as we keep going of using that exact comment, because I think it's really good. Um, and bringing it back to those supervision topics, because we're, we're taking what, what we've gleaned here that's hard for them and, and, and pulling it back to clients. Absolutely. We're going to keep talking about that. So I also think on, on the reverse of that scenario, now that I kind of know that this person has this tricky relationship with their mother, that's going to influence their work with clients, just like the comment, right? How is this influencing your work with clients? So others, uh, our, our stuff comes with us everywhere. Um, it comes into the therapy office with us and, and we can experience counter transference and other biases 
based on our experiences. Uh, I, you know, we all do that as clinicians and our supervisees do too. So if I know a little bit about what those are for my supervisees, what, what are their, some of their hangups that are hard for them? I might be able to use that to figure out how to manage those pieces in their clinical work. Um, and, and it is, the, the, the trick is not to slip into therapy, but getting enough information about what are some of this big stuff in their life that might be impacting um, their work. So I've had um, quite a few experiences, really, where it would have been really easy to kind of jump into more therapy. I'm, I'm sure you all have. Um, I I could have really dove more into therapy, right? Into with this comment of saying, "How long have you had this, you know, rocky relationship with your mom?" That's probably what I would ask a client. You know, it's it's kind of tame, but it still invites a little bit more. Um, it also allows, you know, if if we're going to delicately step into that realm, it allows our clients, or I mean, our supervisees to make some decisions about how much they're going to share, especially if this is the first little bit about them that they've told us, you know, maybe we've been meeting with them 10 times and this is the first time they've really shared something a little bit more vulnerable and personal about their lives. Maybe I do want to stay there just a little bit and kind of get a little bit more of how they're doing with it. Um, But I also don't want to push someone to tell me more. If this isn't therapy, I don't want to, step into that role. Um, so it is delicate. I, um, I think that when I think about therapy versus supervision, if we say therapy is a hundred percent supervision's like 75, we're not going into full therapy. We shouldn't be right. However, growth that we're talking about for our supervisees really isn't achieved. If I ignore what their stuff is and what's, what they're, what they've got in their, you know, their, their baggage, as far as what's coming into the therapy office with them, what are they bringing into session with them? We have to address those things a little bit so that we know how they're affecting counter transference with clients who remind them of their mother or of themselves. Um, So I I do kind of want to know a little bit about it, but we have to be delicate. Um. I also think, and I'll, I'll bring this up again. I think that if you have a client or a supervisee who really feels like this is a big thing, we should be encouraging them to seek out their own therapy to work on those things. Um, if, if we feel like this is continually brought up, I want to make sure that I'm not stepping into that role for them and I'm encouraging them to do some of that work outside of supervision too. Because it's just really not fair to your supervisee or you to try to combine both of those things in supervision. Um, so this is another good comment in here. Not um, Yes, not only how it might affect their work with clients, but how they might respond to you if you're a female. Absolutely. That happens a lot as well, where you have, just like you see it with clients, where they have transference to you. Um, as whatever figure you're representing for them, but your supervisees have some of that too. You've built this beautiful trust um, and rapport, and now all of a sudden, are you this nurturing mother figure? Or do they see you as a mother figure, but they're putting their poor relationship with their mom on you too? And um, I think all of us have different experiences on how we drink deal with transference. For me, I'm probably going to ask about that. If I feel like it's coming up in supervision where someone's having some transference toward me and it's not helpful in any way, I am probably going to say, you know, what is supervision like for you? I wonder what this experience has been like. I might start there um, and see if they will be honest and talk about it a little bit. Or I might very directly say, it sounds like this relationship with your mom has been really hard and I'm in this weird position of power with you where I'm really supportive of you and also trying to help you grow, which kind of embodies some of this paternal or I mean maternal instincts. So I wonder how that plays a role for you right now too. Um, To me that 
is pretty direct and I need to have good rapport with my supervisee before I would say something like that, but it can be helpful, especially if you think that all that transference is getting in the way. So that's a great, a great comment. Okay. So this delicate balance, this balancing the shift, I'm not trying to get too close to the edge, staying back from the edge a little bit. We don't want to jump off the cliff into therapy. Um, if you are working with someone who just has a lot going on in their life that they're sharing with you, um, and you're starting to see that those situations are really impacting their work with clients, um, I do think as a supervisor, it's your responsibility to figure out where that is um, because ultimately you're the one, you're kind of this gatekeeper for someone doing good work. And if all you're hearing in supervision is someone just diving into all their stuff all the time, we really have to pull that back and wonder if that's also coming up in session. It's so interesting how I think we have so many excellent therapists out there, super ethical, doing wonderful work. And then every once in a while, I hear about somebody who's just not doing well, and it is just showing up in their sessions. And it's, it's unfortunate. And I think it's our job to teach our supervisees now how to do this, how to manage those boundaries for themselves. So there's personal stuff doesn't come into session as much um, so that we don't have people in the field, you know, five years later who are struggling with that concept. So I do think that responsibility falls on our shoulders to make sure that people, our supervisees aren't um, bringing too much of their stuff into session. I also think that that self-disclosure piece is really tricky in our profession where we talk about self-disclosure is fine if it's helpful for your, your client. And I think for people who have a hard time kind of stifling their own stuff, even in supervision, makes me worried that their um, view of self-disclosure is maybe pretty loose in session with clients too. So that's probably something I'm going to talk about with them or ask them directly. Um, so I also, I also think it's important if someone shares something really big and we'll get on in a little bit more on those crisis situations, but if someone discloses something really big to you, like maybe their, their partner just filed for divorce or something like that, it, it's, it really feels like an acute crisis. Um, their emotions and their reactions are, are really warranted and you are a safe person, um, but to talk to about it, but you're also getting a glimpse into what their functioning is. So I'm guessing all of you have had an experience, right? Where something really hard's happened in your life. You maybe took a, a day or two off from work, maybe longer. Um, and, and ethically, we need to recommend that for our supervisee too, if that's appropriate. Because it might be taking a little time off if we feel like, eh, this is a big thing and I don't see you functioning well doing therapy with your clients right now. Um, cause we are, again, we're the kind of the gatekeepers for that. So we're not going to be offering them therapy with what's going on, but it is our job to make sure that they're in a fit state to work with other people. So with that kind of special caveat out of the way of, of really encouraging people to take time off, if that makes sense, let's just, let's talk a little bit about the supervisees who spend way more time talking about themselves, um, than their clients. It's, it's easy to, with this picture again, right? It's, it's sometimes easy to jump off that proverbial ledge, um, so to speak, when we have someone sharing a lot, because that's what we do all day. When someone's sharing in, our, in a session with us, we want to encourage that and foster that, um, that kind of disclosure from our clients. And um, so, so it's, it's that balance again. Uh, when I first started supervising, like I said early on, it was tricky because it was, um, I, I knew a lot of people that I was supervising. And so I felt like I wasn't very good at finding that line. And I quickly learned that if I, if I didn't figure that out, um, I, we wouldn't really do supervision. We would just chat and like, that's not appropriate. So I had to really kind of find that line for myself. 
And I quit supervising my friends. That was big for me. I, that's a pretty, doesn't has doesn't have to be the same for everyone. There's no statutes that says you can't supervise your friends or people that you know. But for me, I, I really set a hard line of that. I only really supervise people that I have a professional relationship with uh, I, because it makes my boundaries so much easier, which is good for me. Um, I think good for all of us. I think some people just have um, a different, different relationship with what that can look like. Um, but also there's a, a real power dynamic within supervision years. You naturally as a supervisor have power in that relationship. And uh, it's hard to jump back and forth between being a friend and a supervisor to, to change out those hats. And it's really hard to give sound ethical professional um, supervision to somebody that you're worried about them not liking you or losing a friendship or something like that. Um, For me, it's easier to stay rooted in my role and and appreciating and honoring the power that I have so that I'm not overlooking that and making it harder for my supervisee. Um, By the end of supervision, though, I think that a lot of times I feel um, some sort of camaraderie with my supervisee. The goal is that once we're towards the end of supervision, we have less and less to talk about um, clinically, like we're doing higher level clinical things because they don't feel as overwhelmed with um, clients because that it, that starts to get easier. Um, and I think that it's it's interesting that at the end of supervision, I know those supervisees as colleagues now and as friends, and that feels like an easier shift, um, that there's still a, a power imbalance, to, so to speak, but it, it's not as big. Um, and you can still be supportive and professional to your colleagues and move into friends. So it, I would consider thinking about that is um, if you have a tendency to chat with your supervisees as friends do that's pretty normal but also like save it for after you're done supervising too so a little bit back to the the shift of going back and forth between these things so shifting from personal talk to supervision um if i know a little about a person's personal life a supervisee's personal life um kind of like the example i used earlier with the supervisee not really getting along with their mother I can use that when we talk about cases too. So um, I often see supervisees struggling with clients who, you know, they, they're having, they're experiencing similar stuff. So if you're have, if your supervisee is really struggling with their relationship with their mom, they're probably also struggling with clients who are going through something similar and they might not actually always recognize that. So I would probably say, what's it like to work with this client? Or it makes sense that this client drives you nuts. You know, I I don't know a lot about the relationship with your mom, but this client seems to be similar. Um, I think it's okay to bring all of that in because I want them to start seeing those, how how their stuff is impacting their work with people. Um, Or I might say something like, this client seems really opposite of you. I'm wondering if that gets frustrating sometimes, Um, which I see that too. I talk about that a lot with my supervisees about all of us have a default way of dealing with things that we've learned over time um, that isn't always great. So maybe my supervisee is um, a, a kind of person that is really organized and in control and almost to a fault and can't really stop doing that. And then they're working with somebody who isn't, who won't problem solve with them, who won't be responsible, who quits a job at the spur of the moment. And I bet that person just drives my supervising nuts because it's just so opposite of how they live. And um, I think that's important to bring up. Why is this person driving you nuts? Because you guys are really different and you're trying to get them to behave how you would behave and it's not going to happen. So let's talk about that. That's a really great growth place for for all of us here. Um, So I do think it's our job to bring that up. 
these questions feel kind of similar to therapeutic questions that we might ask a client too. So, so shifting back and forth it from what's this like to work with this client? Cause they're not like you, what does that feel like to, okay, now what do you want to do with that? with this client. Now that you know that, what do you think works for them for change? What does change look like for them? Not what you think would work for you, but for them. So I can't ask that question until we've done a little bit of growth on their stuff and knowing a little bit about their stuff first. Um, I also, I also think that there's kind of these different um, kind of different extremes, right, of, of kind of knowing a lot about our, our clients. So we're feeling, or our, our supervisees, and, um, and then also our clients, and recognizing when our supervisee is having a lot of that counter-transference, because I think we're seeing them talk about feeling really protective or too close to their client, um, trying to do too much for them which I have a couple people right now that that's what we're really working on is backing, backing up, backing up. We don't, we're not the only person in this client's life um, or being really annoyed or frustrated with a client. I think those are really important transference, counter transference pieces that we see. Um, and those are the, those are the lines that I think that our supervisees run the risk of stepping over into the unethical realm of um, discharging or, or terminating or doing something in session because this client isn't, is frustrating to them. And maybe that's not the best option or, uh, taking on too much for a client and building a relationship that is too, um, enmeshed with a client. And that's not what we want either. So obviously our job is to point that out and help identify those solutions and ways of coping with that reality for our, for our supervisees. Okay. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about the reflective practice model, which is, and the fan model, which is facilitating attuned interactions. So we're going to do a little poll here. Um, I am going to have, Sherilyn, are you able to drop a link in the chat too? Michelle's got it. Thanks, Michelle. Michelle's going to drop a link in the chat for you guys. And also if you're doing, if you're watching it on your computer and want to do it on your phone, there's the QR code that makes it a little bit easier. But really what I want to know is, has anybody with us today done th this training before? Um, or are you familiar with it? Or have you been trained in any other type of um, supervision type specific training because we're going to talk a little bit just a little bit about reflective practice but I kind of want to see if anybody in the audience has been trained in it so I'll give you guys a second to get that QR code or click on the link and you should be able to vote and then um, we'll pull it up oh good here's somebody said to put all leaders through fan that's wonderful okay we'll give this a little bit of time for people to vote I feel like this model has gotten kind of popular in Nebraska, which I think is great. Um, the Nebraska Center on Reflective Practice through UNL, the Center on Children and Families, kind of takes the lead on this. And they've done a lot of work with DHHS and some other agencies. We got a grant through Beacon um, with some, some COVID funding to put uh, clinicians through this training. I think we between 25 and 30 clinicians across the state, we, the state we put through this training specifically who are supervising um, provisionally licensed people. So this is great. We've got about 66% of you have not been trained in it. 26 have and 9% and are trained in another model. So excellent. So we here at um, the Grace Abbott Training and Supervision Academy, our supervisors have all been trained in this practice because I think it can be helpful in trying to navigate um, some of these pieces that we're talking about of identifying the emotional, the thinking, the problem solving pieces that go into supervision. So awesome. Thanks for sharing that. I'm going to go back to my um, slides here. And 
Okay, there we go. So I'm going to do a quick overview of the fan model as we get started. Um, this is the fan. So as you see, it kind of looks like a fan. It's not intended to be like one after another. And for any of you who've also been trained in it, feel free to pop things in the Q&A if you think it would be helpful when we talk about this. So uh, basically the FAN model, FAN stands for Facilitating Attuned Interactions. So talking about the importance of being attuned with someone, um, when we talk about trauma and healing, attunement is actually one of the best indicators of change for people if they feel really understood. Um, and listen to and connected to, people are more likely to take the jump um, to talking about change or trying something new. So um, this model has really kind of helped me understand where I am and where my supervisee is in relationship to the client or the issue. So this first wedge, mindful self-regulation, is all about us. That's about getting prepared for your work with whoever you're working with. So doing, if you know you have a supervisee coming that's just tricky to work with, I'm probably doing some deep breaths. I'm going to get a cup of coffee. I'm going to do the things that I need to do to kind of just like feel regulated. And maybe even during the session, I might need to do some regulation type of things. But basically, figuring out where I am and getting prepared mentally for the, uh, the meeting. Sometimes we do that with our clients, too. Then the, these three stages in the middle, to me, are the ones that are more loose. We can kind of flow in between them, the feeling, thinking, and doing. So a lot of times when our clients are coming with a lot of personal stuff happening, we are in the feelings wedge um, and they are kind of having a lot of uh, intense, maybe venting or things like that and moving and recognizing that they're in the feelings stage is more helpful for us to join them in feelings and have some attunement. And then it's easier to move more to like, let's problems problem solve back to your clients or something like that. Um, if, if someone's coming to me and saying, um, oh my gosh, this really big thing is happening. And I'm like, okay, well, what do you want to do about it? And I offer no empathy and no um, support you're going to get a lot of yes, buts. Well, but yeah, you know, so I might have to come back to feelings. So um, I, I think that for those of us who are fixers, which a lot of us are, we're fixers. Sometimes it's hard to sometimes come back to um, feelings with our, with our supervisees, but sometimes it's like we have to go back there and join with them so they can come with us to another spot. Um, but I think that some of the, the the questions, and we've talked about some of these before, that we can do to show empathy and attunement, but also get back to something else is, um, again, right? How do you think this situation is impacting you when you're seeing clients? What does that feel like? Or um, I wonder how it's been hearing about your clients' issues when you feel like you have this big thing kind of looming over your head. That is another feeling attunement type of question, but it's also bringing it back to, to clients. Um, so it, it invites some exploration into their experience, but it's, it's relating their personal stuff to their work, not just their day-to-day -day stuff. So it's, it's that subtle difference of with a client, you know, you're going to dive into their feelings of it. And, and with supervision, maybe we're diving into the feelings that they're experiencing while they're with their clients. Um, so we're still being empathetic, but we're bringing it back to their work as much as possible. Um, I also think that sometimes people, our supervisees, even our clients, even myself, I think I'm in my rational brain and I'm doing all these things and I'm really thinking, um, but really in all honesty, I'm still like in feelings and I need somebody to help me get there. Um, as a supervisor, it's just a, a good idea to have a better understanding of where someone is. So you can meet them where they are. And um, if someone's in their feels and I'm just saying, what are you going to do about that? Um, that feels kind of disconnecting. So I might need to, if I say that and it doesn't feel like we're getting anywhere, I might need to shift back to something like, 
hmm, I can, I can see that this is a really big deal in your life right now. It seems to be taking a lot of, a lot of energy. Um, and at that point we can, we can take it a few ways. We can either decide to listen and let them vent a little bit, especially if this is like their first or second time doing that. Um, but if this is like the 10th time that supervision has been hijacked by something in their life, um, it's, it's maybe more of a shift back to supervision of saying, you know, feels like we've talked about this a lot. And I'm wondering if you need to, to have um, therapy or a different setting to kind of process some of these things that are happening in your life so that we can really use this time to talk about your clients um, or something like it's making me a little worried that the time or the, the, all the crisis that's happening in your life is um, maybe showing up with your work with clients too. I'm wondering if we can talk about that today. So the fan I think is helpful to really start thinking about that these are different things that when someone's in their fields, it's hard to jump to doing. But if we go back and say, I, I hear you, this seems hard. Can we relate it to your clients a little bit? Then once we feel like we've got a better handle on it, we can move into more of the doing and the integration of like, what did, what do you feel is like your takeaway today? What do you, what do you feel like you want to incorporate this week and try? Um, so honestly, I think that this is a really cool model. If you have questions about it or would like to know more, um, they've, th there's a lot of information at the, the UNL um, Center on Children and Families. If you just Google uh, Reflective Practice Nebraska, it will come up. And they have a lot of great um, opportunities to learn and um, trainings to do. Okay, the, there's a great question that came in too that, I, that I'll take a second on. Um, explaining the difference specifically with a supervisee between using an LIPC hat versus LMHP versus LIMHP hat. So I think a lot of, for me, and I'd love if anybody else has thoughts on this because people at different levels and doing different things might need different types of supervision. For me, at the end of the day, it comes back to where is my supervisee? It doesn't make a lot of sense to, um, if I'm supervising a provisionally licensed person who just graduated and they're like, I really want to do, I really want to get my LIMHP. We're all kind of starting at the same place versus a consultation with somebody who's been a LIMHP forever. And they're like, this case is really tricky and I, I need to, some consultation about it. Um, that's going to look a little different because you have somebody who has a lot of clinical skills. So I'm not going to be doing as much. I'm going to expect that they have more case conceptualization um, capacity. Like they're able to do that more. Um, and so their consultation, I feel like, is really more about doing some problem solving and brainstorming together on a solution versus ongoing provisionally licensed supervision feels much more of um, kind of like, how can we figure out some solutions together? Because we're going to be working together for, you know, at the end of, of supervision, you're probably working, you've probably put in you know, one to 200 hours with somebody for just for supervision, which is a lot of time. Um, and we should be seeing people grow from being new to the end of their supervision. Um, we're not having to do as much educating. We're doing more higher level thinking. I hope that that explains that a little bit, because I do think that also I supervise people who are um, social workers people who've gone through a counseling program and we have different ethics. We kind of have different mindsets of how we approach things. Um, and I'm really upfront. I use a lot of interpersonal process. I'm trained in EMDR. I do a lot of trauma work with people. So I, um, my style is naturally going to be different than someone else's style. But when I have a supervisee who's like, I love CBT and that's all I use for everybody. I, I, don't use as much CBT. So it's my job then to be educated in the model so that I can talk with them about what feels um, uh, appropriate and genuine for them and their style. I can't just make everybody be therapists like I am. I need to be respectful of what their style is and have them talk about it 
And my job is to be educated enough in, in different modalities as well so that I can help them grow in those things too. So I always think about you get a lot of CEUs for supervising people, but that's because you need to be doing a lot of educating on yourself so that you're not just getting little ducklings out here who are just like you. You're cultivating supervisees in their own path, in their own genuine style um, as well. So that maybe was a little bit of a diatribe into the weeds on that question, but I appreciate it. I think it's a good one. And if you have more questions about that, put that in. I'm not sure if I answered it exactly with how you were questioning it. So, okay. So that was a little bit about the, the fan model, but I want to talk about, uh, I want to just put in a little scenario here and we're going to do some more interaction with this as well. Um, but this is the scenario. You have a supervisee, Cassie. You've been working with them for a few months, so not super long. Maybe you've done, you know, eight to ten supervisory sessions with them. Um, and Cassie comes into your office or your Zoom room. I do a lot over Zoom, so that's that's a thing. You say your pleasantry, hi, how it's go, how's it going? Do you have a nice weekend, etc. Most people will be like yeah, my weekend was good. I went to this restaurant. I did this thing and that's it. Um, but Cassie comes in and she says, oh my God, I got in this huge fight with my boyfriend. And he told me last minute on Friday that he was going to go see a friend who was in from out of town and they were out till 2 a.m. And he was totally hung over all of Saturday. So I couldn't get anything done. And then on Sunday, he made me go to lunch with him and his mom, who, by the way, can't stand me. And oh, yeah, we got really into it on Sunday. I'm still pissed at him. He acted so caught off guard, like he had no idea that I was even pissed. And I've barely even talked to him since then. So like all of this just like flies out, right? <laughs> and you're like, okay, well, it's Wednesday. And you've been upset for three days when you're you just like spewed all of this at me. So um, I, uh, hearing all of that, right? It's like, what's your first reaction? That's what I want to know. So we're going to go back to Slido. And um, so in the chat, again, you can actually use that exact same link, which is still in there. Um, or if you still have it pulled up on your phone or whatever, um, if you want to pull it up, I'm going to stop. I'll give you a minute to, to click on the link again, and then I will pull over. We'll pull over there so we can see. I want you to just free type in, like, what's your, a couple words. What's your first reaction to a supervisor coming in and just like laying that on you? Okay, here we go. <laughs> These are great. I'm going to let them come in and then we'll kind of scroll through them a little bit. Yeah. Ask how they're feeling, carrying out their work. Wow. Sounds like a lot's going on. Yes. A lot is going on. Take a deep breath. That's a great one. Let's just do some grounding. Yep. See if they're in feelings or ready to move to thinking. That goes back to the fan model, which I think is really, can be really helpful in situations like that. Yep, we've created an environment of open communication. You have wonderful job at rapport. <laughs> so validating and centering back on on how that might impact. Oof, that's my response too. Oof, oh my. How are they taking care of themselves? Guided reflection on who my supervisee support system is, how they're doing that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Those are really awesome. I think for me too, is kind of like, this is a lot. How are we going to talk about clients when you've just like thrown this out there? Right. Can you scroll down it a little bit so we can see some at the beginning too? I, I got, we, I wanted to see some at the beginning too. Yep. Irresponsible. Yeah. So feeling like, yikes. Okay. What's happening here. We want to make sure that that's being dealt with. Mm-hmm. Awareness about the potential impact on her work. Yep. Sounds like a lot. So I think those are great. I think all of that are my responses to of what, hold on, I got to figure out where we're going with this because this feels like a lot. Um, 
So I appreciate all of your answers because I think that that is the piece that we deal with all the time of, even with clients, if you want to go back up to the top, we'll see some of the new ones that came in. We deal with that with clients too, where they come in with crisis after crisis after crisis. And you're like, okay, we can't get away from this. Um, yeah. Acknowledge that it's Wednesday, presuming that they've seen clients the last couple of days, acknowledge how much it's impact them and ask if they're taking care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That was my thing too. It's Wednesday. You said this happened over the weekend. And the first thing you did was blow in here and just like, um, totally just divulge all of this. So that that's where my brain goes to what's been happening the last three days here. So, okay. If you want to stop sharing, we'll go back to the PowerPoint. Um, and I wanted to make sure I'm trying to make sure I keep up with all of our Q and A's here too. So, I wanted to look at this one really quick before we pop over there, um, just to finish up my last slide. So critical to think with, with supervision that maintaining the conceptualization of the case must return to the guidelines of theories that we're trained to use and how we see those in action. Yeah, so that guideline really helps keep us on track that we're really thinking about modalities. And um, I talk a lot about with supervisees and students alike that uh, our conceptualization of the world and the humans in it and how humans behave really helps us think about the theoretical approaches and modalities that feel genuine to us. So sometimes um, how I view the world is going to be different than how a supervisee views the world. And so coming back to my modality is going to be natural for me, and I'm going to do some of that. And also recognizing that for my supervisee, their natural modality might be something else. So I need to make sure that we're we're using that to our advantage of growth instead of um, expecting them to come back to mine. So, and Kristen, yeah, um, we can definitely do some follow-ups. I'll make sure that you have access to my email address um, at the end of this because I do a lot of consultation as well. This is hard and I feel like a lot of times supervisors feel a little bit lonely out there doing this work. So um, building up a little network is, is great. So keep the questions coming. This is great. So, okay, let's move on with this scenario and let's talk about Cassie. So we did this already. What's your initial reaction? How'd you feel about it? Wonderful. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to put three, whoop, let me do it over here. I'm going to put three options up here, right? Because I just chose, or four options. I just chose some options that I think are um, things that maybe I would say too, right? I'm creating the training, so I'm going to create things that I think I would say. But bringing it back can be tricky. You don't want to feel impersonal. But it's diluting the process of supervision by pulling the focus away from professional development. Like, I can't dive into that with her. and Tell me more about what your boyfriend did. Um, it's, it's kind of counterproductive. But I actually use a lot of clinical techniques to do this. And you guys talked about a lot of clinical techniques in your, in your comments about it. So it makes sense that I'm going to draw on that for my supervision as well, right? Um, my first reaction to that, to that, what it brings up for me is I'm annoyed. I'm a little annoyed, right? That here we are and how, how is it that three days later, you're still really frustrated about this. And then I'm also like doing all this clinical assessment of Cassie in my head of like, you set zero boundaries. There was no, <laughs> there was no, um, conversation until the Friday night and you blew up, Right. And like, I'm, I'm being super judgy in my head, which I think we do that naturally with people who maybe behave differently than we do, or that people that just come in and like, uh, kind of overwhelm us with this big thing. It feels like, oh my gosh, like back up a minute. Um, but I need to, you know, whoop, push that down. That's about me. I, I can recognize that. I'll put that back in my backpack, you know, of my baggage. Um, so I'm going to pull from some of my clinical skills. And like I said earlier, I use a lot of interpersonal process theory. So it makes sense that I'm going to draw on that, right? That's my 
that's that's my clinical bent. So uh, I'm going to use comments that might verge on a therapy a therapy session, something that I might use with a client too. Um, yeah, and so I think these these four are um, comments that I might use. So I'm gonna we're gonna come back to those in a minute because I want to kind of see what you guys are thinking of what feels natural that you might say, right, in this situation. But I think that if we are um, looking at these questions, they're all asking our supervisee to kind of honestly evaluate their supervision or their, um, their situation in supervision, their situation that they've just shared with us, but in not a, a super prying way. We don't want to invite more content about this story. Um, but I do want them to think critically about how their lives are playing into their therapy work. You guys had a lot of great comments about that specifically. These comments are, like I said, kind of genuine to my style, but they do offer a little bit of empathy too. And they're directing the conversation more to professional topics. So I also think how your supervisee is dealing with stuff in their real life gives us a good indicator of how they're doing work with their clients. Um, I, I want to know some of this stuff sometimes because um, if I feel like if it's impacting their their work with the these clients, for example, in this situation with Cassie, if the thing it brings up for me, um, like I said earlier, that relates back to her clients is like the 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 first time she was upset was like three days later it felt like there was this big, you know, she was holding this grudge and maybe not setting boundaries. A lot of us do that, right? It's not super uncommon. Um, and it's hard to walk that line, but it could show up in therapy when she has a client who's really hard to open up. I think people get frustrated, especially new clinicians, because it's work to get someone with a lot of defenses to talk about their vulnerable stuff. And so we come in with a lot of empathy and a lot of patience, and eventually we get sick of it, right? And we blame the client and in supervision, maybe we say something like, I don't know how I'm supposed to work with this client if they won't talk about anything. And so instead of taking a hard look at the insecurities that that, that clinician is feeling um, and maybe looking at what am I doing, what could I be doing differently, um, or am I, am I hindering the situation? Should I be changing my approach? That's sometimes a hard a hard thing to do when you're feeling a little insecure and it's easier to, to maybe blame the client, like, well, they're just not ready to do therapy or we're not a good fit. Um, and, and I bring this kind of situation up because it could be something for Cassie the same way of like, I'm just letting things go until I'm annoyed. And then I'm going to like kind of throw a tantrum about it. Maybe she won't do that with the client, but I do think that that's an important piece that might come up. Like file that away in my brain of this, th that could be a tough situation for Cassie with clients. I'm going to remember that so that I can talk about that. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's important that we're forming an understanding of how our, our supervisees are functioning to an extent. Um, I, I think it's important ASWB, which for social workers, right? They're they're our code of ethics, um, and everyone has everyone's code of ethics talk about you know relationships with supervisees, but encouraging boundaries and professionalism with with supervisees, just like clients. Um, we're doing work. We have power again, right? And you know, we're really kind of controlling if someone can get licensed or not. So we need to keep that in mind. And the the flip side of not bringing the situation back to work with their clients is us endlessly talking about their lives and getting to a point that it's hard to switch out of that friend role or therapy role. So holding someone accountable to their work and bringing it back to their clients is really important. Um. So I'm going to, I want to look at this other question that came in and then I really want to, I really want you to kind of vote of, we're going to go back to Slido. I want to see what you guys really think um, in this situation. How would you respond using these four examples? So let me, I'll give you guys a second to pull up that link again. I'm going to read this question too. 
I think it would be really important to induce, introduce a concept of boundaries with the people we supervise to include an understanding that we will and will not, what we will and will not do in our lives as professionals. This means what we'll share, um, self-examination and how we might encourage danger zones in our work in relation to our personal selves. I think that that's wonderful. Having those conversations are really helpful as far as um, having individuals set lines like that. And like, it's good to talk about so that we can always come back to that. And I think it's really hard to figure out what that line is in the moment sometimes. So it's good to have this initial guide of what that looks like. And I think it's important for us as supervisors to be flexible so that we're recognizing that somebody's in this weird emotional headspace and they're having trouble seeing that line so that we can pull that back. So it's not an expectation that someone's going to be perfect at it, but it's that this is our guide and we're going to work within these boundaries. And if I feel like we're getting out of those boundaries, I'm going to, I'm going to help bring you back in within these boundaries. Absolutely. That is 100% part of our role as a supervisor. So I'm going to stop sharing. Hopefully you guys were all able to click on that link. We'll get it pulled up again. Awesome. Okay. I like it. Top answer. I wonder how, how you think this situation may have impacted your work with clients this week. Yes. I think that that's a good one. We'll add a couple more people vote here. No and like, who else have you talked about this situation? Oh, maybe a couple people. It just switched. It's a long time to feel this annoyed. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think the top one usually feels the most <clears throat> genuine to people. Yeah, I think the top one feels the most genuine, the most open. Like, let's try to parcel this out a little bit and see if you can tell me what this has been like with with your clients. I think the second one, I'm curious what you'd tell yourself if you or your client starts to create some accountability. That one is a little bit trickier, but it's um, kind of saying, let's take you out of this victim role and let's put you in the driver's seat. Where would you take it? And it gives us a little bit more information about some of the clinical things that your client might be doing as well, which might be important. If you've only been working with Cassie for a couple months, you might not have a great insight into that yet. So um, that could be a great question to, to ask um, so that you can get a little better understanding of what are you, how, what would you tell a client if they were having this situation so I can kind of judge their clinical skills as well. Uh, The third one is a real good transference question, right? How many clients do you have right now that remind you of this situation? That also gets us to this place, right, of a little more specific from question one. Like, I want to know which clients you're going to have trouble seeing this week (laughs) because you're really activated right now. Yeah. And the last question I think is really inviting If you feel like this isn't the first time that Cassie has said these things and you haven't even been seeing her that long, I want to know, like, who else are you talking to about this situation? Because if she's like, oh, I've told everyone in my life and I'm still this pissed, I'm like, wow. But I might recommend, you know, it might be really helpful for you to do therapy too. It seems like some of these crisis situations keep coming up and you've been talking to a lot of people, but you're still feeling really unsettled. Like, this might be a bigger situation for you. I might not say that first, right? But also I think it's important to say, who else are you having a a support system with that can help you navigate this? This is hard. So, um, and and maybe saying, I don't want to be the person that helps you navigate this. That's okay. Um, So excellent. I think these are good, good questions that all get at different pieces and you might use variations of these questions with different supervisees to help get a a better understanding of of how this is impacting them. So thanks, Sherilyn. All of your interaction with these trainings, I think a webinar can be a little bit dry if, if I don't hear from you. So thank you so much. Okay. So I, I think the, (laughs) 
supervision, we go into it. Sometimes if we're brand new, all of a sudden we're like, holy cow, supervision is a little harder than it seems. <laughs> Figuring all of this out, going back to that percentage um, statement that I had about how if therapy is at 100%, supervision is like at 75%, I'm doing the same type of um, uh, thinking and dissecting issues and things like that that I'm doing with with clients. I'm doing that in my head with supervisees too to ensure that we're 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 doing good work. Um, for those of my colleagues who do a lot of supervision, we talk a lot about how we don't see as many clients anymore. We've switched. Our clients are now our supervisees. We're not doing therapy with them, but we're doing a ton of therapeutic things, not only about their cases, thinking critically about their cases and helping them work through that clinically, but we're doing a lot of thinking about the stuff that they're bringing in to um, their supervision sessions to make sure that we are um, taking into account what that looks like. So um, we we don't we don't want to work with supervisees who are just there to complain or talk about their personal lives all the time, but we don't want to ignore it. So how how do we kind of delicately talk about that with our clients to to deepen the growth? Again, this that's that's the that's the goal. Um, I tell my Super, or supervisees and students that I work with that clinical work is a real balance between understanding ourselves and our balance and, and our, our, not our balance, our baggage um, and how that gets activated with our clients. It's understanding that piece of it as early clinicians. It's that just as much as having skills to help our clients because we are constantly being activated um, you know, to be truly empathetic and attuned, we have to, to go to that place in ourselves that's vulnerable and feels the things that our clients are feeling. So no wonder we get activated too. Um, and we're reminded of our stuff because that's how we connect with people a lot of times. We just, we can't avoid our stuff in session, but we we can create a system for ourselves that keeps those in the backpack and zipped up, Right our our baggage backpack because that's coming with us everywhere but we need to help our supervisees find those safeguards um, so that when they are working with people and clients they can keep their stuff safely stored away um, I think that is the real crux of how it turns into therapy because we are helping our supervisees figure out how to set those boundaries for themselves. And we also, at the end of the day, we want to foster good clinicians who aren't going to burn out too quickly. And clinicians who burn out quickly are often ones that are getting activated a lot with their clients, all that secondary trauma. So, um, yeah, I think that there is some common themes that I often see with supervisees and um, there it's that fixer mentality, right? So wanting to fix everything. And um, I think that that can look a couple of, of different ways, but often um, I, I see client or supervisees over preparing for clients, having an agenda for each session. I think it creates some issues with being flexible in session with clients and allowing them to lead or the client to set the direction. And it feels out of control for this newer clinician, which I totally understand. However, it's an important aspect of therapy and something we need to help encourage in our supervisees to be flexible and to let our clients help lead the direction. Um, so sometimes I think that that fixing mentality can um, really lead the therapist into jumping into problem solving too quickly in, instead of allowing their clients to process things first. So when we talked about the reflective practice model, if we jump into problem solving and thinking too quickly, people come up with all those yes, buts, right? And well, that's not going to work because... And so uh, our, as supervisors, we need to be mindful of that too. We're, we're not just correcting everything or giving our opinion. Because um, <clears throat> what, what are our supervisees learning then? We can't expect just to pound knowledge into their heads, even though our solutions are brilliant. We can't expect them to do that and, and 
do, you know, be little mini me's. So people have to be invested in the process and not told what to do. And that's a skill. It, it took me a little bit to learn in, as a supervisor. Um, there's a lot of educating in supervision, but it isn't all we do. When we're teaching critical thinking skills, if I just tell people what to do and not teach them how to do it on their own, next time um, we're, we're not really being helpful. So there's um, sometimes we are modeling that behavior and supervision to help our supervisees model that and do that with their clients too. So I think that's a real important piece of this, how we can show kind of how to do some of these skills with our supervisee talking about cases so that maybe they are going back into session with clients and not feeling like they have to fix everything. So um, sometimes there's a real sense of failure when clients, when I'm working with supervisees and they, there's this real sense of fa failure that I sense from them when their clients don't want to do what they suggest <laughs> or, um, you know, they say like, I taught them all these coping skills, but they won't do them. I can't force them to do this. Like it's their own fault. Their life sucks. <laughs> I did all this stuff with you. Um, so I like to start with a kind of a gentle statement. Um, obviously like what, what's that bringing up for you? What's it like seeing your client not use the skills about what skills that you talked about or taught them? What does that bring up for you as the clinician? Um, because I want to see, I want them to talk about this sense of insecurity or failure and they may or may not do that, but that's the first step, right? So, you know, what is that, thinking about that for yourself, what is that like for you when you're working with clients who aren't um, following through with, with things that you've worked on in session or things that you've talked about. For me, it's really frustrating sometimes to watch someone continue to make the same decisions or the same mistakes, right? It's not really a mistake, but the, just the same choices that they've always made and that, that are really not helpful. And then, you know, kind of see them do that over and over again. It's really hard to watch that. I want to make sure that I'm validating the supervisee's experience in that as well. And um, talking about why that's frustrating and then also um, remembering to start off with something you know really validating like that and then also say something like you know um, it, it's hard to watch clients continue to struggle too sometimes I feel responsible for that um, and yet I know how stubborn I can be and I don't like to always follow the rules and do what's best for me all the time. So I might say stuff like that because I want to start switching to the clinical side of it too. Sorry, my computer just broke. So <laughs> that's awesome. I am going to pull up my PowerPoint and we'll keep going. So that's embarrassing guys. Sorry about that. Okay, good thing we have lots of computers in this building. We will get through this, people. Sorry about that. That is not usually something that happens. So I think that my computer wanted to update and it did not like what I was doing. So kind of going back to focusing on our um, supervis supervisee stuff and wanting to kind of fix everything. Um, I think that that is a really tricky place to be sometimes um, for us and making sure that we are um, going back to how is that impacting their work with, with clients. I think that that's really important. Um, so um, the next piece of that is is really understanding kind of like what we were saying, right? What What's it bringing up for you as a supervisor? And then talking with your supervisee, what's this bringing up for you too? Um, and so that we can bring that back to their work with clients as well. That can be really, a really tricky place to be. Um, but also then moving into that imposter syndrome, right? That piece of 
it feels really bad when you're trying to work with clients and they're not doing what you want them to do. A lot of times, and I feel really insecure about myself and my abilities um, when, when really it's just about being new and not understanding how all of that looks. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are bad at what you're doing. It's normal, but also it's tricky. Um, and then the, the defensive piece of that is really, um, we get clients all the time. I talked about this a little bit earlier in the session where we have clients who are really defensive and don't want to, um, open up. And so we're like doing all this good work and we're building empathy and we're building rapport and it's still not working. And they're like, well, I'm done. I'm not a good fit. I don't want to do this with them. And as a, uh, the supervisor, I'm like, okay, well, that's not really how it works. You know, sometimes, yes, absolutely. Somebody is not ready to do their work. And so we're not going to force them. And if they're not ready to be in, um, in therapy, then I'm not going to, um, make them be in therapy either. Uh, however, sometimes, um, that isn't the case. Sometimes we just have a supervisee who's, who's, oops, sorry, who's, um, frustrated. Okay. So I also really want to, um, figure out how to support somebody and make sure that they are feeling comfortable in their skills, not only with somebody who's hard to engage with, um, but it doesn't always work out how we want it to. Sorry, this is a tricky little thing to navigate when you lose your computer. So we're getting there. So I think a little bit, we talked about crisis situations and how frustrating that can be um, when you have somebody who may or may not be um, in a crisis often. So like Cassie came in, right? Our example with Cassie, she came in in a crisis situation. And sometimes that is, um, unique, right? Where it happens once and it's a big deal, but other times it feels like our, our um, supervisees are coming in with crisis after crisis after crisis. And it's really frustrating to figure that out. Um, just like our clients who, you know, it's like, I can't ever get into something deeper because every week something new has happened. So I think once you start to notice this pattern in your supervisee, it's important to, um, be a little bit more direct. So something like this, it seems like each week something new is happening in your life that feels really big. I'm a little concerned that it might be impacting how you're able to show up for your clients. What do you think? That feels genuine to me. It feels empathetic, but it also feels like I'm being direct about what's happening for them. And I think that's important for our um, supervisees to really take a step back and say, oh, okay, I wasn't really concerned, but now you're bringing this up. So that, that can be alarming for some, for some of our um, supervisees too. So these sometimes I, I chose like three comment, three reactions to that, that could possibly be shared by your supervisee. And I think the first one that's the most alarming for me usually is when a supervisee is saying, oh no, it's not impacting my work at all. And I'm like, really? Because I don't feel like we can ever get past talking about crisis in your life. Um, so those things are really interesting to me. My first response is I want to educate and hold, hold boundaries and do all this work with them. And in all honesty, I probably need to take a little step back and um, think about why, it, like I would do with a client, I wonder why this this person doesn't feel super safe to do this work right now. Um, that, that's a tough question. Sometimes we're not always going to know the answer, but I think it does go back a little bit sometimes to that imposter syndrome or something that a client is experiencing that makes them feel really uncomfortable about, uh, the situation. So, um, I think that sometimes my, my approach to this is starting to um, 
not compliment, but praise when, when they're saying, oh, no, nothing, it's not impacting. Let me tell you about my clients. Here are all these things that they're doing that's really good. And I'm like, mm, okay, good job. I'm, that's really awesome, you know, and I might say it's really unique for a clinician to not have clients they're struggling with. You know, um, even really seasoned clinicians have clients that are hard. You think we could talk about those? And um, if if they're still having trouble, like, um, nailing that down and really going there with you, sometimes it is about continuing to build that rapport or going back to rapport building and, and spending some time there um, to see if we can get a little deeper. Because I have... Um, in the past, jumped into being more stern and setting more boundaries and what does this look like? It doesn't mean that I'm not going to do some of that, but I also think it creates this wedge of people kind of dig in more and are, are going to not share. I'm sure that you all have examples of working with clients where maybe that has happened, where it's getting frustrating, where you're in therapy and we've been working together and you do not share anything. And you're like, usually setting more boundaries or being more stern doesn't work. And it doesn't usually work with supervisees either. So I might try to come at it in a different way. So when they're talking about a client, like, oh yeah, they're using their coping skills. And, you know, usually this kid got in fights all the time and this week he didn't. He like went and and went to the counselor's office. It was like amazing. I feel like we're doing all this good work. And I'm like, wow, great job, you know? And also... I wonder why, you know, I might ask questions to get more at the clinical stuff by saying, I wonder why you feel like it took him so long to really implement that. What else, What do you think was going on that was impacting his ability to do that? So I'm going to ask some really pointed clinical questions to see if they can break down the, the situation a little bit more for me. And I can get a little bit more about what they have been doing or what they, how they understand the situation. Um, another example of, of kind of diving into um, that, that clinical piece of it is um, saying, I, um, like, I, w I wonder what, where that kid, like, learned that, you know, fighting or, or um, you know, having a big explosion like that was okay. What, what's happening at home that, 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 that maybe influenced that? Maybe, maybe not, right? I am going to start thinking about this case clinically, and I'm going to ask a lot of clinical questions about it. If somebody's not giving me a lot, but they're talking to me about these cases that they think are going really well, I want to dissect them a little bit, see how my client or my supervisee can talk about it. Um, so that's for that. Oh, no, this isn't impacting my work at all, right? I'm going to start taking some different methods of getting drilling down to maybe situations that we do need to address clinically and supervision without trying to tell somebody like, um, you know, I don't want to shame anybody, obviously. I want to set some boundaries, but there's there's a lot of ways to come at a problem. And if you feel like your supervisee is not going to open up in the way that you think that they are, then we got to be flexible and try a different way, just like with our clients, right? So there's that line between therapy and supervision, again, of I'm using some clinical skills to get answers that I'm not asking directly for. Um, I think that's okay. The second one of I'm feeling really overwhelmed and maybe I need a break. Um, great, right? Maybe you do. Maybe you do need to take a couple days off. Maybe that's really good insight. But if it's becoming a pattern, all of a sudden you recognize your supervisee has taken a break, you know, has taken a day off a couple times this month already because of a situation or situations, um, or this just seems like starting to become a pattern, I, I, that's another thing we need to be addressing and setting some boundaries with of how a pers somebody's personal life is now imp impacting their professional life. I get that some things are out of our control. And if we feel like it's becoming a problem, I do think that we need to say something like, um, you know, you do have a lot going on in your life right now. And also professionally, your clients do too, um, typically, and really need to have consistency when they're coming to therapy. And I get that I don't want you to be in the office if you feel like you can't do the work. And we have to figure out a better option than of just canceling on clients because they um, they need you to be consistent. So what what do you want this to look like? Um, I I think that's part of our job as well 
you know, I don't want to tell someone to take a, to not take a day off if they can't do the work, but also maybe we need to think about, maybe we need to scale back your caseload. You know, maybe you can't handle working four or five days a week. Maybe you can only handle working two or three. And if you're already taking days off and you're not technically getting paid for those or whatever that looks like, maybe we need to think about scaling back your caseload a little bit. Let's talk about those options. Um, and then also recommending therapy or who's your support system who's helping you through this because I can't be the only one kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. The last option is probably the one that I'm hopeful to hear the most, right? Uh, it might be impacting some of my work, but I think it's only with certain clients, right? Good. Let's talk about who those clients are and the transference that you're feeling with them. That's perfect because um, I I don't want to ignore the big things that are happening in their lives, but I also need to know that they're going to be safe with their clients. Yeah. Okay. So the last piece that I really want to talk about is how we do this in group supervision. So I don't know how many of you do group supervision, but it's pretty common. It's a nice way of kind of, um, doing supervision in a new way. I think for the people we talked about on the last slide who are saying, oh no, it's not impacting anything, who are really having a hard time opening up. Like, it's kind of like they don't have a lot of problems telling you about their personal lives, but they have a lot of problems telling you about things that aren't going well with their clients. Um, I'm guessing all of you know exactly what I'm talking about or have ideas in your head of what that looks like. Sometimes they're a really great option to put in a group because um, I don't want them to get ignored. I don't want them to get lost in the group, but also I have a little bit more control of, there's a little bit more accountability for people to talk in a group versus if they're just in, in individual supervision. So I'll give you some examples. So um, with the idea of allowing all supervisees to do case conceptualization, I usually start out my group supervision um, well, I, I'm going to back up a little bit. The state of Nebraska allows you to have up to six people in supervision. To me, for my style of supervision, that's maybe a little too much. I'm really comfortable at three. Three feels good to me. I can I could do four, but they'd all have to be pretty far in their supervision and doing pretty well. Three feels like in an hour I can manage everybody's, you know, needs. Um but a lot of times how I start off a group supervision is I'll say, hey, you know, how's everybody doing? Good to see you, blah, blah, blah. Who has a case that they'd like to talk about today? And usually my supervisees are pretty good about bringing things. And I will take responsibility to make sure that people, uh, people have equal chances to share each week. That can be my job. But um, I allow someone to start talking and sharing a case. So after they talk about the case, I might, you know, do some sort of empathetic statement of like, wow, that sounds hard. That's, that's tough. That's a tough case. But then I'm going to kick it to my other supervisees. I'm not going to start talking about it yet. Just like we would in group therapy, right? I wonder if anybody has any thoughts about that. For most of my people who've been in a group for a long time, they don't even wait for me to ask that question. They just get started, which is great. I want that. I want that collaboration between my supervisees. I think that that's really helpful. Um, but also for the person who's not really vulnerable in supervision, it allows me to get a better um, look into their ability to case conceptualize things with not a lot of information. So if their answers or solutions or, or problem solving or, you know, talking through the case, if their piece of it feels like really disjointed or, or not very appropriate, I have a, I, I, I might have a better um, chance of seeing that in a group because there's a little different um, accountability there of like, you you have to say something like the person next to you gave this interesting insight and you can't just say yeah i agree with them like that doesn't that that doesn't feel um for most people that feels not great they can't do that every time you know there's a different accountability there so sometimes i can get a different sense of um 
maybe if they're more willing to talk about cases that aren't their own and you can get a better sense of, of how they're doing clinically, but also how they're sharing, um, getting uh, the normalization of doing case conceptualization, watching someone else do it, sometimes can calm their nerves a little bit or make them feel like it's okay to be vulnerable because it's been normalized within this group. So talking about a case that felt harder might feel safer when you've seen all these other people do it. Um, and I think that that's also, that also can be a really important piece that group supervision brings that we don't always get in individual supervision. A caveat to that though, is I've had some supervisees where I've had in a group and I feel like I have some concerns about it. Um, and I feel that they might need to come into individual supervision because now I have enough information that we need to really probably work on some things. Like if it's an ethical concern or boundaries concern, or maybe I feel like they spend a lot of time chatting about themselves in their sessions, ooh, you know, stuff like that makes me something that throws up a red flag for me. I might um, privately, you know, send them an email or, or ask them to meet me at a different time and just say, Hey, I, I feel like there's a couple things that I would like to work with you on. And I think it would be easier to do that on an individual setting and ask them to come to individual for a while until you, until you can, can work through some of those things. But I do think group supervision creates just a really nice way for people at similar levels to interact with each other, to feel normalized to get an opportunity to flex their muscle, not only just of like talking about a case conceptualization, but also thinking about one and giving um, feedback on a case, I think is an important skill too. Um, the other thing is it's easier in a group, I think, to jump, or not easier, I think that it looks different in a group to jump between clients and experiences. So naturally, when you're working with a group for longer, there's little things that come out, personal things that come out that are real connectors. And so we can ask questions about those things within the group of, um, you know, I, like if somebody's saying this client is so hard, I just feel incompetent, I feel stupid, whatever, um, you know, then you get a turn to the other members in the group and say, I wonder who else has felt that way. <laughs> What did you do about it? You know, how did you deal with your own feelings in session when you were feeling really a lot of counter-transference with somebody? So they help do some of their own work together within the group. And I think that that can be really valuable as well. So, um, yeah, I think that so much of supervision is about us as supervisors managing um you know, our supervisees experiences as well. And sometimes it can be really hard to jump between um, that piece of wanting to know your supervisee better so that you can help them be a better clinician and then also keeping it on clients. So I am, we're getting, we're almost to the end here. We've got, I don't know, about eight or nine minutes left in this training. I would um, love to get any other comments or feedbacks or, um, scenarios. If you have them, feel free to put them in the, the Q and A. Again, I apologize for the huge disruption with the computer issues. I appreciate you guys being patient and hanging with us. Um, I do know that that is going to create a problem with us putting the link for your CEUs in. However, we have everybody who's been on the call. So we are going to send out an email after this presentation with the link to do your evaluation for your CEUs. Again, we'll put in the chat here, I'll do it right now, um, our email address. Or you all got a message from Michelle before the training. Um, so you can respond to us however you need to if, if for some reason you don't get the CEU or the evaluation link because we want to make sure you guys get um, get all of your ethics CEUs. So with that being said, is there any other questions, concerns, thoughts um, as we end our time together? Oh, here we go. 
Um, oh, okay. How have you, or how would you manage supervision with a supervisee who's disclosed a significant mental health diagnosis is reactive, defensive, demonstrating difficult communication patterns, yikes, triangulation. Um, I'm going to stop sharing that way. Okay. Supervisee is actively involved with external mental health supports and has accommodations at work. Well, I think that that's a really, that's a really tricky place to be, obviously. I think that um, the best thing we can do is help set guidelines or boundaries for working with clients. So if this person is reactive and, and demonstrating difficult communication patterns, it, it probably is going to feel more like therapy for this with, for this person. Um, it's almost going to be like we're doing DBT. Uh, we're going to be acting, we're going to be asking a lot of questions about what's being brought up for you when you're working with this client. Um, because I can see that it's activating you in, in a certain way. Um, I also think that it's important to be the gatekeepers here too. If we feel like somebody really is not um, able to manage the the workload or the type of work, um, I'm I'm never one for stifling someone to do what they want to do. And also, if someone isn't ready to be doing this on their own, like maybe they've got their 3000 hours. I do think it's okay to say, I'm still seeing some of these things that are happening that are a little concerning to me. Um, I think we should still, we should continue on with some supervision. And if the person has a lot of feelings about it, they can contact the board. They, there's solutions for it. But at the end of the day, I don't want to be signing off on somebody's hours if I don't feel like they're right for the job. I would also probably get there if you're not their super direct manager or supervisor at their job, I would see if you can have a kind of that relationship too, so that you all are on the same page of helping keep this person as successful as you can. So yeah, that's a tough question and it's probably really nuanced. So, <laughs> okay. So this is an interesting question too. What happens when a supervisee asks to become a client following supervision? To me, I think it depends on how much you have disclosed to them. How well do they know you? And are you okay with them knowing those things if they become a client? I probably am going to shy away from that a little bit just because I think that that boundary is a tricky one for me. But some of us have really specific um, clinical um, specializations that maybe our client would, or our supervisee might really benefit from. But I think it's more about setting really intentional boundaries at the beginning and talking about what that's going to look like and letting our potential client decide if if they're willing to do that because you are probably going to show up different as their um, therapist versus their supervisor and I think it's important for our supervisees to if they're going to become our clients they need to know that up front and be able to make that decision if you feel like the boundaries are going to look a lot different so for my supervisees, I'm also their supervisor for their work, so I incorporate self-care discussions, thoughts on that. I think that that's very important. We should be talking about self-care um, a lot just in general because we are talking so much about the stuff that's getting activated in session and that secondary trauma. Uh, we need to be talking about how are you taking care of yourself and what does this look like? Because if we're asking and working with our clients to do that, we need to be good models and good stewards of that too. Um, and some of that can also be talking about what your self care looks like. So encouraging your clients to take a lot or your supervisees slash, you know, um, yeah, well, they're they're under you, right? So you're taking a lunch break. You're encouraging them to take a lunch break. Like you're also modeling what that looks like. Um, so I think that that can be really important. Also recognizing that your power looks different if you're signing a paycheck um, and signing off on their hours. Like recognizing that the power looks different there too. And it doesn't have to get in the way of supervision. But I think as supervisors, it's important for us to recognize that we probably have to keep even less self-disclosure and we can't be friends with, with them and things like that because of both of those roles. Yeah. 
Oh, this is a great question. Would there ever be a reason in which you would stop supervising someone or when you would say no to supervising them? Yes. I um, interview all of my supervisees before I work with them. I have a little bit of an understanding of what's happening. I also um, make it very clear if I have somebody who's not showing up for supervision or I feel like they're kind of flaky, you know, of saying, you know, I, I'm not going to sign off on the, on the weeks that you weren't here, which we should be doing anyway. You know, life gets in the way I get sometimes, but for the majority of it, um, we shouldn't be signing off if people aren't showing up. But I might also say, I don't feel like this is a priority for you right now. And this is a part of your license. So I'm not going to schedule with you. It's like a client, right? If you're kind of no showing or canceling all the time, I'm going to say, I'm going to take you off my schedule until you feel like you're ready to do this. Um, but I have also said no to people because when they show up, I feel like they're, um, kind of like that, that situation that someone had mentioned about, like, there's this like significant thing happening that I think is hindering their work with people. People have a hard time kind of stifling that if you're doing, um, a good consultation about like, what are you hoping to get out of supervision? What's your style working with people? Let me talk to you about what I have, you know, my expectations for supervision. What do you think about that? What is What does that sound like to you? If I'm asking enough good questions, hopefully I'm getting enough feedback from people that I can tell right now if like this person is going to be really hesitant to do anything different than what they're doing right now. Because I, that's a, that's a hard supervise you to work with that's a that's a really big question that I could probably talk about for a long time and it's 1259 so I want to be mindful of that however I'm going to really quickly put my email address I know that I'm under Michelle but that's okay um I'm gonna put my email address in here too you can find me on our website um and I it, I'm more than happy to sit down and do a consultation if you're having problems with your supervisees or have more questions. My ultimate goal is that through GATSA we'll have some um, super or consultation groups for supervisors. We're not quite there yet, but you're not alone in this. This is hard work. And at the end of the day, I appreciate you guys being supervisors and interested in being good supervisors and dealing with all of our stuff here that has happened today during this training. So anyway, we will email you all the evaluation and your CEUs, and I hope you all have a lovely, lovely weekend. Thanks for sharing a couple hours with us today. So.